The final item of business today is members' business debate on motion 8342 in the name of Marie Gougion on Heads Up for Harriers project and the role of species champions. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Marie Gougion to open the debate. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I really wanted to start this debate tonight by taking the second part of my motion first and thanking Graham Day for all the work he's done in promoting the Species Champion initiative, because if it hadn't been for that, then I wouldn't have been bringing forward this debate today in my role as the Species Champion for the Hen Harrier, which sadly is a red-listed species of conservation concern. And I think it would also be quite fair to say that when I took on the role, I don't think I knew what I was really letting myself in for. <laughs> um, because this role has honestly been one of the most challenging and contentious things I've undertaken in this parliament. But I am so glad that I did and that we have the dedicated time to discuss this today. Because in spite of that, my interest today is exactly the same as it was when I assumed my role as species champion for the hen harrier. And that is the welfare of the bird itself, a magnificent raptor that I want to see flourish in Scotland. Unfortunately, however, we're not at that stage yet. And one of the main reasons for that has been the illegal persecution of the species over a long period of time. Now, historically, the hen harrier was persecuted to extinction on the mainland UK in the 19th century. A population survived in Orkney and during the 20th century, harriers managed to re-establish themselves back on the mainland. In some areas, the population grew to the level you would expect due to the suitability of the habitat. In most areas, though, harriers were still the subject of persecution. That continues to be one of the main reasons why there are so few of the raptors today, because across Scotland, we have the habitat for the species to exist. Almost half of Scotland has habitat capable of supporting a hen harrier territory, with nearly 37,000 square kilometres predicted to be suitable for breeding harriers. Work carried out by the Joint Nature Conservation Committee based on three national surveys of hen harriers in 1998, 2004 and 2010, and using their predictive modelling, estimated that the national hen harrier population of Scotland should be in the range of 1,467 to 1,790 breeding pairs. Instead, we have fewer than 500. The latest hen harrier survey shows that there are only 460 breeding pairs, a fall from 505 in 2010. In the last 12 years, the population has dropped by 27%. Harriers are particularly scarce in my constituency of Angus North and Mearns, an area where they have existed in the past. The British Trust for Ornithology Bird Track Service recorded only nine sightings of harriers in Angus and eight sightings in Aberdeenshire for 2017 so far. So what's being done, done about it? Since the Natural Justice Initiative in 2008, the Scottish Government has had in place a process for the prevention, investigation and prosecution of wildlife crime. There's the Partnership for Action Against Wildlife Crime, or PAW, in Scotland, and the PAW Scotland Raptor Group, whose membership comprises representatives from a variety of organisations and sectors, including the police, shooting industry, the science community and conservation groups, with the ultimate aim of reducing raptor crime. With so many groups on board, you would think that har harrier conservation would be progressing, yet this hasn't necessarily been the case. Only this year, we've had the disappearance of hen harrier Kaluna and the shooting of a hen harrier in Lead Hills. In terms of enforcement, this kind of crime is particularly hard to prosecute. Evidence I heard directly as part of my time on the Justice Committee when we held an inquiry into the Crown Office. The nature of the crime means it happens in remote areas, particularly hard to police given the huge areas that wildlife crime officers are expected to cover. I attended the Hen Harrier Day at RSPB Loch Leven Reserve in the summer, along with Andy Whiteman and Alexander Stewart, where we heard from those involved in investigations across the UK, looking at the simply horrific footage of what is being done to these birds, and hearing about how, the cases have, how hard the cases have been to prosecute, in Scotland particularly because of the laws and corroboration. And we'll all be aware of the case earlier this year, where there was video evidence of a Hen Harrier actually being shot, but the evidence was deemed inadmissible in court. The Scottish Government produced the satellite tagging review earlier this year with measures introduced by the Cabinet Secretary as a result of that and I look forward to, hear, to hearing about how these are progressing in the hope that they will tackle some of these issues identified. 
But in terms of prevention of crime and supporting conservation, one issue at the heart of all this is the lack of trust between conservation groups and the commercial interests of the owners of upland habitat. A lack of trust I completely understand, but something which the Heads Up for Harriers project in particular is trying to tackle. Now, this project is led by Scottish Natural Heritage for Paul Scotland, who work with the states to identify, monitor and thereby protect hen harrier nests. The project is vitally important because it highlights the other reasons why hen harrier nests fail and gives a fuller picture of what the species is up against. I met with SNH, the Wildlife Crime Unit and Scottish Land and Estates to discuss the project and saw for myself the other factors which can lead to the failure of nests, including fox attacks and chicks simply overheating. The project is still in its early stages, but the number of states involved has gradually increased over the past few years, from five two years ago to 21 estates this year. The number of estates managed for driven grouse who are part of the project has risen from three in 2015 to 14 this year. And the number of estates with successful nests has risen from two in 2015 to six this year, with 37 young successfully fledged. 21 estates is only a fraction of those that exist across Scotland, but I would urge the many others to get involved and get on side with this project. Because while Heads Up for Harriers does have its critics, we have seen the number of successful nests and successful fledglings increase, and this can only be a good thing. Another positive is the work carried out by the Lang and Moore Demonstration Project, which has been running since 2008 until this year, where the use of di different techniques such as diversionary feeding have seen populations of hen harriers grow alongside grouse, though the final findings are still to be published. Again, a project not without its critics, but a hugely important piece of work. If my role as species champion has taught me anything, it's that this is an extremely complex issue and that there is such a delicate balance to be found in the conservation of this hugely vital and important species. And I genuinely want to thank Kelvin Thompson, Duncan or Ewing, Ian Thompson, and the countless others who've taken the time to meet with me and to help me get to grips with some of the issues involved. Heads up for Harriers may not be the immediate panacea to this, but it is a promising step in the right direction. And along with the likes of the Lang and Moore demonstration project, they show how a balance can be achieved. We need to take every available measure to crack down on the serious crime that takes place against raptors and tackle the illegal persecution that we have all seen the direct evidence of and which has brought this species to the verge of extinction. But at the same time, we do have to recognise the good work which is taking place. We can't tar all estates with the same brush and we need to recognise the positive steps that some estates and some gamekeepers are taking to promote the species. We need conservation groups and shooting interests to set aside their natural distrust and try to work together because only then do we have a hope of protecting and encouraging the growth in numbers of this magnificent species. Thank you. We move to the open debate and speeches of up to four minutes, please. And I call Donald Cameron to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I refer to my register of interest in the fact that I own a land holding in the Highland region? Um, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Mary Goujon for bringing this important issue to Parliament. As a species champion for the Merlin, I have a keen interest in the conservation and protection of our indigenous birds of prey, especially the Merlin. Um, having met recently with the Scottish Raptor Monitoring Scheme, I'd like to recognise their crucial work in surveying birds of prey in Scotland. Indeed, members of um, the SRMS won the Political Advocate of the Year Award at the recent Nature of Scotland Awards, further proof of the important work they've carried out. It's important to appreciate, as Mary Goujon has already said, the wide range of factors that influence raptor populations. In other words, in addition to human persecution, birds of prey face existing underlying pressures through indirect human activity and processes such as urbanisation, which may cause habitat loss, for instance. Merlin populations were heavily affected by organ chlorine pesticides from the 1950s, and the species hit an all-time low in the 1960s. And despite a decrease in pesticide contamination levels since the 1980s, the Merlin is still the most heavily contaminated species of raptor in the UK, according to the RSPB. Although populations have been slow to recover, they have been hindered further by human activity, which can directly affect the success rate of breeding, for instance. In 2015, the Merlin had the highest percentage of breeding failures caused by direct human activity. However, as we are all aware, deliberate and illegal persecution continues to threaten the very existence 
a raptors. We need to end this persecution and find a way in which we can grow and sustain raptor populations within Scotland. There has been much criticism of those in the grouse industry who actively persecute birds of prey. Now, I think we all acknowledge that grouse shooting is an important industry for the rural economy of our country, and the vast majority of land managers, whether they are owners or employees, use sustainable environmental management practices to a high standard and operate within the law. And it's important to note that many estates carry out measures to conserve and preserve raptor populations. And while I become quite ingrained in issues around the Merlin and didn't know a lot about Harriers until the Heads Up for Harriers project debate, uh, I do commend Marie Goujon for promoting this work. And I was delighted to see that 21 estates have signed up to the project. Raising awareness is only one side of the coin, and we need to work with these projects and estates to encourage an active role in the protection of birds of prey. And in my view, collaboration is key. And I note the supportive briefing from Scottish Land and Estates provided today. The Heads Up for Harriers project is certainly a model to be followed in other parts of Scotland. We have to acknowledge there remains a small minority of people who continue to take extreme and illegal measures to increase grouse populations and do so by a number of actions, including unlawful persecution of raptors. These actions are deplorable and should be condemned by us all. One of the main challenges we face in the conservation of these birds is collecting data. The number of confirmed cases of persecution fluctuates notably, largely due to the fact that cases are stumbled upon by chance. The Scottish Raptor Study Group insists that these cases are only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the real figure of crimes committed. This is why the work of groups such as the Heads Up for Harris Project and the Scottish Raptor Monitoring Scheme is so important because their continuing efforts to gather more da data will help us establish how best to deal with this issue. However, and I would like to close on this, there is room for optimism. This problem is not beyond our control. Over the last 30 years, we've seen several raptor species recover in numbers, such as buzzards, which are now common in many parts of Scotland, and ospreys that have seen significant investment in nest protection schemes. And I'm acutely aware of osprey success in my own home of Loch Abba. Through raising awareness and encouraging active engagement with conservation schemes such as this, I'm confident that we can save our indigenous birds of prey from extinction. Thank you. I call Christine Graham to be followed by David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I congratulate Marie Goujon on securing this debate and declare an interest as a member of the RSPB. I speak in a more light-hearted vein as species champion for the house sparrow. And with every right, as every morning without fail, I feed a flock of some 20, which commute from my neighbour's holly tree to my plentiful feeding stations, take a dip in another neighbour's bird bath, preen themselves perched on my weeping birch, and then return to the safety of the holly tree. They have living the good life down to a T. But let me take you back 66 million years when dinosaurs ruled the world. Then an asteroid struck what is now the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, sending a rain of debris around the world that set every forest ablaze and blocked out the sun for several years with the soot, ash and debris thrown into the atmosphere. Life on Earth was devastated. With the sun blocked out, plants would have died off around the whole globe, decimating the plant-eating dinosaurs and the carnivores that preyed on them. Only seeds may have survived, so too a small group of dinosaurs existing primarily on seeds and insects, something teeth wouldn't be necessary for. Birds have no teeth. And so this brings us to the house sparrow. As a small seed-eating bird, it's very close to the kind of dinosaur that would have survived that mass extinction, whose size would have allowed some to be hidden and sheltered when the blast wave came and its seed-eating habits would have given it a plentiful supply of food. This leads me to the observation that we don't hear very often. Are we listening to bird song? Or is it dinosaur song in the morning? Now, that diversion explains why that wee, unglamorous bird to this day knows how to make it through life's challenges. And I conclude, as I have before, Deputy Presiding Officer, quoting Norman McCaig's poem, Sparrow, that wraps it all up. Sparrow, he's no artist. His taste in clothes is more dowdy than gaudy. And his nest, 
that blackbird writing pretty scrolls on the air with the gold nib of his beak, we'd call it a slum, to stalk solitary on lawns, to sing solitary in midnight trees, to glide solitary over grey Atlantics, not for him. He's rather a punch up in a gutter. He carries what learning he has lightly. It is in fact based only on the usefulness whose result is survival. A proletarian bird, no scholar. But when the winter soft shoes in and these other birds, ballet dancers, musicians, architects, die in the snow and freeze to branches, watch him happily flying on the O levels and A levels of the air. Yes, his dinosaur predecessor survived the asteroid attack. So really, it's no skin off his beak to survive a Scottish winter. I call David Stewart to be followed by Graham Day. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and can I start by congratulating Mary Goujon for securing the debate in the Chamber this evening. Uh, thanking also for her work for Species Champion for Hen Harriers, and she seems to be extremely conscientious in that, and I think she gave an excellent speech uh, this evening. Um, I myself am Species Champion for the Great Yellow Bumblebee, uh, and once a year at, at these debates, uh, the Great Yellow Bumblebee badge gets taken out of the box so I can proudly wear it uh, in the chamber. Uh, a species once found across the whole of the UK, but now only on the north coast of Scotland and some of the islands. And like the great yellow bumblebee, hen harriers are facing, as we've heard, serious decline and need urgent help. This is why it's so important that we get the opportunity to congratulate the Heads Up for Hen Harriers project and discuss the further work that needs to be done to protect these birds. <coughs> and according to the latest study by RSPB, numbers of this iconic raptor are fallen by nearly 10% since 2010. Hen harriers, as we've heard, are down to 500 breeding pairs, which makes the species vulnerable to the effect of habitat degradation and wildlife crime. Studies suggest that the main reason for the decline in hen harriers' numbers is persecution, illegal killings and trapping of nesting pairs. And the number of harriers near driven grouse moor areas are particularly low, and in some areas are even regionally extinct. The hen harriers are wonderful birds of prey, native to Scotland, and hold much interest due to the male sky dancing mating display to attract females, circling the ground and then plummeting to the earth before swooping up at the last moment, rolling over and head down again. And I would recommend this perhaps for Christmas parties if people want to try uh, and intimidate that or interpret that. But with over 80% of the UK population being based in Scotland, it's an extremely worrying sign when the numbers here drop. By the end of the 19th century, they could only be found in the Northern and Western Isles where there was no persecution of them. And conservationists, conservationists have been working extremely hard since then. And when numbers peaked in the 1960s and 70s, they've started to decline again. And as we've heard in 2017 this year, 21 estates signed up to the Heads Up for Hen Harrier scheme and seven estates are successful at nests with 37 young fledglings. But still more needs to be done. Getting more estates, particularly those with grouse moors signed up to the project, would increase research on how many young there are, but the work can't stop at the nest. Once the chicks leave, illegal persecution is still a problem. Almost all the losses have occurred in areas managed intensively for driven grouse shooting. There should be more investment in satellite tagging. The birds must be monitored so their progress can be followed. And, President officer, I would strongly endorse the RSPB's LIFE project, which incorporates satellite tagging, on-the-ground monitoring, nest protection and work with volunteers to protect hen harriers across northern England and southern and eastern Scotland. But we also need to support the SSPC and the police in cracking down on wildlife crime across Scotland and ensuring that both the penalties and conviction rates are increased significantly. I thank the member again for initiating this debate. Hen harriers, in my view, are a barometer of the health of our biodiversity in rural Scotland. We must support every initiative and every opportunity to support this iconic raptor. I call Graham Day to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, allow me to begin by congratulating Marie Goujon for securing this debate and apologising to you in the Chamber for having to leave before the debate is concluded owing to another engagement. The uh, issue of hen harriers, or lack of, in areas of Scotland is a deeply serious matter. The polarised nature of the views on the subject also sadly reflect 
the nature of the wider argument around raptor persecution. President officer, there's nothing that can be done to change the past, the unacceptable criminal historic persecution of these birds. So without in any way seeking to gloss over what may have happened, I want to focus on the here and now, and indeed the future, which undoubtedly must have the heads up for Harrier's project at its heart. And whilst the headline figures of having 21 estates participating in the scheme, which produced 37 young this year, it is pleasing, particularly when 11 of those estates are located in the Angus Glens in Aberdeenshire, which have such a poor reputation around hen harriers, I was actually more intrigued by some of the underlying data. A total of 11 nests were monitored, with nine producing those 37 birds. Uh, incidentally, that compares with five nests fledging 14 chicks in 2016. But the reasons behind the failure of the other two nests were what caught my eye. In the first instance, it was down to fox predation, and with the other, which was located on a grouse moor in the Angus Glens, an area where notoriously no hen harriers have been recorded for many years, natural causes was at the root of it. Now, in the black and white world of raptor persecution, the absence of hen harriers or nest failure is almost inevitably blamed on illegal activity. And let's be clear, such activity is utterly unacceptable. But here we have evidence to back the counter-argument that sometimes, although not as often as some might argue, there are other explanations. And that's why, why we need to clamp down hard and that, uh, on human predators, so there has to be a role for managing others. And for those of us who occupy that middle ground, abhorring raptor persecution, but frustrated by the attitude and approach adopted by some at the other end of the argument, evidence is the key to making progress. That, and I would contend, enforcing the Muirburn Code, therefore by ensuring potential hen harrier habitat isn't removed by burning hillsides of a certain gradient in breach of the regulation. That's the only way we'll challenge those. Absolutely. Claudia Beamish. Taking intervention. And would the member agree with me that in terms of um, persecution, uh, that it is very, very important that we analyse the possibility mm. of there not having to be corroboration for um, this, the, the, the terrible crimes that go ahead because of um, the remoteness of the areas in which they happen. And Lead Hills, in my own um, constituency, is an example of, of this possibility. I, I, think that, I think that's a difficult subject to, to, to address in a debate of this nature uh, tonight. Uh, as I say, I, th I think it's only with evidence, it's only by enforcing the Muirburn Code properly will we challenge those who are guilty of exaggeration and those indulging in deflection and denial and make the kind of progress the overwhelming majority of us want to see made. And to that end, let's send a message from this Parliament tonight that we want to see many more estates, particularly those involved in driven grouse shooting, participating in this scheme, thereby both restoring species numbers and developing our understanding of the impediments to that. Marie Goujon's motion, of course, references not only her championing of the hen harrier, but the wider species pro, uh, champion programme. And I'm proud to be an active participant in that. But rather than wh wax lyrical about my role, I want to highlight the work of some of the real heroes of the scheme. Not the MSPs who front it, not necessarily even Scottish Environment Link or their member organisations, but the people who are out in the field almost daily seeking to save these species. And right at the heart of that stands the staff of the Royal Botanic Gardens, Edinburgh. Presiding officer, I'd previously visited the botanics to learn of the work they were doing to restore woolly willows and heard about their replanting activities in Gwendal in my constituency. But three months ago, I joined the staff on an expedition to Corrie Sharrock and saw up close and personal the lengths they go to in order to deliver these objectives. They were in an area to replant alpine blue sow, uh, thistle, another of the 181 threatened Scottish, Scottish plant species. I tagged along in order to view nearby woolly willows. Well, I say nearby, the woolly willows were in some rather high altitude, inaccessible locations. The heights the botanists were scaling to plant alpine blue sow were on another level, quite literally. It was dangerous work. Um, these guys are the real heroes of the Champions Programme. And the irony is that as a non-NGO, the Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh aren't members of Environment Link and therefore not formally part of the Species Champion Programme. Presenting officer, I wish there was time available for me to more fully illustrate the role being uh, carried out by uh, the botanics around uh, this sort of subject, but uh, frankly, we'd be here all night, and I notice you warning me to uh, wind up. <laughs> so I'll uh, settle simply for this, for reiterating my absolute respect and admiration for the work that they do. Presiding officer.
Well, you milked that rather well, Mr. Day. <laughs> and I call Andy Whiteman to be followed by Liam McCarthy. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer, and thanks to Mary Gujong for uh, this debate, which covers two topics, the Heads Up for Harriers project and the role of species champion. And I agree with her and other members that the role of these champions is important for raising awareness uh, and promoting the protection of various threatened wildlife. And I'm delighted to be one of the 90 species champions currently lending support to this initiative, in my case, to the Mountain Everlasting Wildflower. I also endorse the member's concern about her species, the hen harrier, and the need for action to protect the declining Scottish population. However, I cannot support the member's view that the Heads Up for Harriers project has undertaken, and I quote, intense efforts to protect the hen harrier from extinction, nor her assertion that this project has made, and I quote, considerable efforts in trying to reverse the declining population. Rather, this project fails to address the fundamental threat to hen harriers, which is the illegal persecution of the species on some intensively managed driven grouse moors, a fact that is recognised by decades of scientific publications and also acknowledged in the Scottish Government's most recent annual wildlife crime report published just the other week. Indeed, I believe this project is being used as a greenwashing exercise to hide the criminal activities undertaken by some within the driven grouse shooting industry and to promote the misleading impression that it is voluntarily cooperating to clean up its act. The main objective of this project is, and I quote, to better understand the threats facing hen harriers and ultimately promote recovery of the species by working in partnership with land managers. This is to be achieved by placing cameras at hen harrier nests situated on private estates to identify the cause of nest failure. This is a flawed approach because those intent on killing hen harriers will not target a nest if they know a camera is present. And so illegal persecution will not officially be identified by the project as a cause of nest failure. Whereas natural causes, as we heard from Graham Day, such as poor weather or fox predation, will be disproportionately recorded. And Graham Day talks about an evidence-based approach. This project will obviously result in bias data. And indeed, the grouse shooting industry has already pointed to this as official evidence that hen harrier breeding attempts are only failing due to natural causes and have suggested that illegal hen harrier prosecution, persecution is, and I quote, an historical controversy, as Tim Baines of Scottish Land and Estates Moorland Group wrote in June this year. Happy to do so. I, I thank the member for uh, taking a brief intervention. Would the member agree with me that um, consideration of um, a consultation on um, the licensing of driven grouse moors would um, go some way towards um, analysing this um, very serious problem of persecution in an appropriate way? Andy uh, Whiteman. Uh, I, it, it, it may do, but the problem with this crime is it's committed out of sight uh, with no corroboration, as the, as the member herself was, was, was pointing out. Uh, and therefore, I think it would be of limited value in targeting and resolving and getting better data on illegal persecution. Now, in addition to this flawed approach is the issue of transparency, or more important, the lack of it. It has been stated, and members have, have raised this, that in the three years the project's been running, seven of the 11 successful nests were situated on estates managed from driven grouse shooting. This claim is disputed by conservationists who believe the nest cameras have only been deployed on estates where intensive management for driven grouse shooting does not take place. However, when a freedom information request was submitted, asking for the names of these estates to enable scrutiny of this claim, the Scottish Natural Heritage refused to release the information. Presiding officer, this is a publicly funded project being used to portray an image of positive cooperation from driven grouse shooting estates in the name of hen harrier conservation. And yet the names of the participating estates are being kept secret from the public and even from one of the project's partners. Presiding officer, I commend Mary Goujon for her work and taking up this difficult species, uh, the hen harrier. But, hen har but Heads Up for Harriers is a flawed project which I believe risks undermining the hard work needed to eliminate wildlife crime. Thank you. I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Officer, can I also uh, thank Marie Goujon um, for not just her motion in securing this debate, but um, I think as other, others have said, for her work uh, as a species champion 
on behalf of the, uh, the hen harrier. I think the Species Champion initiative has been one that is innovative, captured the imagination. Graham Day, I think, rightfully pointed to the fact that the, the, the real champions are those that are um, doing this day in daily uh, on behalf of the various um, species. But nevertheless, I think it's given a profile uh, to an issue uh, that very much needed to be bumped up. Uh, the agenda. I take my responsibilities as champion of the Scottish Primrose uh, seriously and I'll return to this uh, later on. But hen harriers, uh, it, it, as, as others have said, um, are certainly in need uh, of championing. Uh, as David uh, Stewart indicated, we are the, the stronghold here in Scotland of 80% of the UK's population. Uh, but the most recent hen harrier survey uh, showed a worrying decline between 2010 and 2016 of around 9%. The, successive, uh, the second successive decline in such uh, surveys. Uh, I'm pleased to say that Orkney, along with the Western Isles, has bucked that trend and that um, over that same period, the numbers in Orkney uh, of territorial pairs rose from 74 to 83. But overall, the picture is not at all good and I think provides the context for this debate and for considering the uh, Heads Up for Hen Harrier project. I think Mary Goujon very helpfully um, did this in pointing out uh, the ongoing problems with illegal and deplorable raptor persecution uh, as well as uh, the, uh, the impact of habitat. Uh, loss. And I'm not wishing in any way to denigrate the efforts of the estates participating in this project. They do, I think, deserve to be commended for what they are doing. However, it should be borne in mind that none uh, represents a raptor persecution hotspot uh, or it has been suggested operates as an intensively managed uh, driven grouse moor. And I think until that is addressed, we'd be perhaps well advised not to draw too much comfort or potentially misleading conclusions uh, from what emerges from the project. As I say, it is not a uh, criticism of those taking part, but a cautionary note that I do think needs to be entered into this debate. In terms of the current project itself, uh, I think it might be helpful either for the Minister uh, or for him through one of his colleagues to confirm whether or not the birds under observation are, are, are tagged. There certainly seems to be a case and, and, and a logic uh, for doing so. But in the limited time uh, still available to me, and with Marie Goujon's indulgence, uh, I, like others, will make mention of the Primula Scotica, on whose behalf I have happily volunteered to take up the cudgels. Uh, Gail Ross, I thought rather impudently, was laying claim to Orkney's KW postcode in a debate last week. No doubt she will be quick to point out that the primrose is the county flower of Caithness. And on this occasion, I am happy to share uh, with her this most iconic uh, and rarest of flowering plants, the entire global population of which is to be found only in our respective constituencies. In Orkney, its location of choice tends to be the windswept cliffs, dune stacks and headlands along the Atlantic coast, Yesnaby, Hoy and South Walls, Rousey, Westry and Papi, although I gather there are some outliers in Shapensey as well, which bucks that trend. But say what you like about the Scottish Primrose. It may be tiny, but it's tough as old boots. It does, though, uh, need a helping hand. It needs grassland to be grazed, so the traditional farming practices that have maintained these habitats in the past are vital for its future. In turn, we need to support those farmers committed to carrying out this type of grazing management going forward. If we don't, if we fail to make progress in tackling climate change, flower of Scotland, when will we see your like again may be a question we're asking ourselves sooner rather than later. In conclusion, uh, Deputy President Officer, I thank and congratulate Marie Goujon again for bringing this debate uh, to the Parliament. Uh, I wish her all the best in her uh, endeavours on behalf of the, the hen harrier population. Thank you very much indeed. Gillian Martin, followed by John Scott. Thank you, President Officer. I just want to thank my friend and colleague, Mary Goujon, not just for bringing this debate to Parliament, which allows us all to speak about our own species as well, but for all the work she does to highlight the issues the hen harrier faces. When you get made a species champion, you could go down the route of championing something cute or cuddly, or like Ms Goujon, a species to campaign for. But you could, like me, go for the high drama and choose something that is a sprawling behemoth, a lifesaver, a record breaker and a spiritual icon. And I figured that if you're going to champion anything, best go big or go home. And that's what I have done in choosing to be the champion of the U, Scotland's oldest tree. When I was a teenager, I can reveal that I was a bit of a goth. Hard to imagine now, but 16-year-old Gillian Taylor, as I was then, loved a bit of Bauhaus and Sisters of Mercy. I liked to crimp my black dyed hair. I wore the old crucifix for non-religious reasons. <laughs> I never, ever wore anything that wasn't black. 
So when the Woodland Trust told me that the yew tree was the tree of death, I was sold. <laughs> tree of death, you say? Well, that's a bit depressing, but actually it's far from depressing because the yew really symbolizes death and resurrection, mainly because it resurrects itself all the time. When its branches touch the ground, it forms new trunks, and so effectively is immortal. It regenerates itself. It's like the Doctor Who of trees. It's the Time Lord of trees. Throughout history, the yew has also been one of the most spiritual of trees. It was a sacred tree for the Druids, representing longevity and regeneration. And for us Celts, it also symbolizes death and resurrection. For Christians, it's often associated with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, hence why it makes an appearance in so many of our churchyards. And of course, the proximity to graves and churchyards might be the reasons why, depending on your perspective, it's either it's very unfortunate or very cool emo nickname. The Fortingall yew in the constituency of Rosanna Cunningham is thought to be Scotland's oldest tree. It stands within the churchyard there and has been there for between 3,009, sorry, 3,900 years. And one of the myths surrounding it is that Pontius Pilate was born under its branches. One thing's for sure, that yew is one of the oldest living things in Europe. Now, people like to make connections between their species on why it's appropriate for them. And I could be negative about the age thing, but I've decided that I very much like the idea of being associated with longevity. And anyone who's been to see the Fortingall U will know that the old girl is looking pretty great for her age. So I'd like to try and associate myself with that sentiment also, particularly as next year is the last year of my 40s, so I need all the positive vibes that I can get. But the yew is also a lifesaver. Its toxic needles are harvested and used to produce cancer-combating drugs. In fact, in the incredible Pitmedden Gardens in my constituency has got some of the most stunning yew hedges and trees in the whole of Europe, and it sends its yew hedge cuttings to pharmaceutical companies for that very purpose. And when I visited in the summer, the head gardener gave me my own little, yay high, little yew tree which I now have in my own garden. And I like the idea of us both growing very, very, very old together. <laughs> uh, the last of the open debate speeches is John Scott. Thank you, uh, presiding officer. And can I begin by declaring an interest as a farmer and an owner of land which is part of a hen harrier special protected area. Can I also congratulate Mary Goujon on securing her motion for debate this evening and also ask members to note that I am the species champion for the grayling butterfly. Presiding officer, this is a welcome debate tonight, largely on the future of hen harriers, which as we all know is regrettably a species very much under threat and that is why I support the Heads Up for Harriers campaign. It is, of course, a matter of regret that the number of sightings in Scotland in 2016 has fallen by 9% since an earlier study in 2010. But I would note that 2016 was a particularly poor breeding year, and the vagaries of nature does have a dramatic effect on breeding patterns of all our birds on our Scottish hills and mountainsides. Of course. Andy Whiteman. John Scott for taking his I'm curious to know how he knows that, given that we do not know the numbers that are uh, illegally killed. John Scott. I think if you check the record, Mr. Whiteman, you will find that I said that weather has an effect on the breeding patterns of the, the mountainsides, but I'll check my own notes for myself. Yes, it was a poor breeding year. Yes, that's, that's a recorded fact that 2016 was regarded as being a poor breeding year. Anyway, presiding officer, having lambed black-faced sheep in what is now protected Han Harrier habitat, habitat, I know from bitter experience that lamb crops can vary hugely between good years and bad in the same habitat as hen harriers are trying to breed in. And I know all too well what an impact bad weather, such as late snow, heavy rain, high winds and throws can have on the survivability of chickens and lambs alike on these moors. In addition, snow, frost, wind and rain, and often a lack of sunshine, also affects the food supply, 
of hen harriers as well. Because in bad weather, voles, which are a natural food supply of harriers and the staple of fledging chicks, also don't breed easily or well either. And so the survivability of hen harrier chickens becomes harder. For example, on the 21st of April 1981 is forever etched in my memory when a freak snowstorm hit southwest Scotland where I farm and I spent days four and digging out of snowdrifts, using lambs buried in snow at this most, most unexpected time of year for snowfall. And working from dawn till dusk and beyond on that occasion, we only lost about 25 lambs that year because of this unseasonal blizzard. But neighbours I know lost over 100 lambs, and I would confidently bet that 1981 was also a bad year for hen harrier chick survival. In addition, false control of the lack of it, particularly on land adjoining forestry, reduces all drowned nesting birds' abilities to rear chickens, affecting peewits, curlews and snipe, as well as hen harriers. And this is a growing problem with forestry planting targets increasing. Of course, I'm in favour of that, but nonetheless, it is a growing problem, with foxes coming out of forestry areas onto open moorland to hunt for food. And while it may be different now that the Forestry Commission is coming under control of the Scottish Government, certainly in the past the Forestry Commission did not control foxes or other vermin within their forests. And while forestry land provides terrific breeding habitat for foxes and crows, their natural food supplies are much reduced by blanket Sitka spruce afforestation, and these predators have to find food on adjoining moorland and farmland, namely ground nesting birds. And given that the Forestry Commission has historically not controlled foxes or carrion crows, will the new Forestry Commission under the Scottish Government control now consider taking on this responsibility in order to play their part in reducing fox predation of hen harriers and other ground nesting birds? Indeed, it is worth noting the correlation and the decline of other moorland ground nesting birds where there is no suggestion of human persecution and comparing the rates of decline of hen harriers. So I welcome the fact that 21 estates have now signed up to the Heads Up for Harriers project. And notwithstanding the alleged predation of hen harriers by land managers, I still believe that the safest place for hen harriers to raise chicks is on a well-managed grouse moor where foxes are kept under control and a good supply of voles and grouse chickens exist. I hope more estates will join in this scheme and I hope hen harriers' numbers are restored in future, notwithstanding the pressures they face. Thank you. I now call Joe Fitzpatrick to respond to this debate. Uh, around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to start by congratulating Mary Goujon um, on securing this opportunity for the Parliament to help raise the profile of the hen harrier and the challenges that this iconic bird faces, and also to allow our other species champions to raise awareness of their species. Um, I think what was important was that we heard that this is not just about uh, cuddly animals, um, it crosses the animal plant kingdom, and we heard from Liam MacArthur, um, I can't read my writing, Gillian Martin and uh, Andy Whiteman, that they are champions for uh, plants of different, different sizes. Um, I think it has been a very interesting debate and there's been many valuable points have been made. Um, as I mentioned, the hen harrier does indeed face some serious challenges. There has been a worrying 27% decrease in territorial pairs in Scotland over the last 12 years. And over the last six years, we've seen a further 9% decline in the Scottish population, down from 505 territorial pairs in 2010 to 460 pairs in 2016. These falls in population numbers are particularly important for the conservation state status of the hen harrier because, as David Stewart um, said, Scotland have around 80% of the total UK population of, of hen harriers. We know that there are a number of factors which can affect hen harriers, for example, habitat loss and cyclical nature of prey availability, as was raised by both John Scott and Graham Day. Um, However, hen harrier populations remain in good health in areas of Scotland such as Argyll and the Western Isles, uh, the, Western Isles the, the Western Seaboard and Orkney. And most of these areas um, are not optimal for the hen harrier in terms of habitat and prey availability. So is that because these areas have little or no driven grouse shooting? 
Conversely, there are areas such as the Central Highlands, North East Glens, the Southern Uplands, where there is good prey availability and habitat, but hen harriers are not thriving. These are, reason, these are areas that are associated with driven grouse shooting. It's our view that, that is not, there is no coincidence here and illegal persecution um, is, is ongoing in these areas. We know that the record crime, that recorded crime figures for hen harriers are low, but we also know that there are no carcasses or other hard evidence of criminal activity. It's difficult for the police to record each missing bird or missing tag um, as a crime. However, the Golden Eagle report uh, published at the end of May made a powerful case that a significant volume of illegal killing is taking place and that it does not make make it onto the official recorded crime figures. And there's no reason to suppose that that same analysis would not um, also apply to hen harriers. Um, I know that in the case of the, the Golden Eagle report, there was a degree of um, reliance on the, the, the tags. Um, and I can't confirm whether that opportunity is also available for um, uh, the hen harriers, but a, the point has been made and I'm sure the cabinet secretary will hear that. Um, so that doesn't mean that unrecorded crime goes unnoticed um, or that we are actively seeking, we're not actively seeking to tackle it. But clearly in order to understand what is happening, we need good um, data. And Donald Cameron uh, told us about the work of the Scottish Raptor Monitoring Group in that field. Um, we've tackled, we have a track record of bringing forward innovative measures to tackle raptor persecutions, including the introduction of vicarious liability, the development of a poisons disposal scheme and the restriction of the use of general licences where it is suspected that wildlife crime has taken place. And the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform announced a further package of measures at the end of May this year to tackle this issue. That included the strength, strengthening of police resources to tackle wildlife crime in the Cairngorms National Park and the establishment of an independent group with a remit to look at how grouse moor management can be made sustainable and compliant with the law. Licensing will be one of the options that the group will be examining. However, to be quite clear, we don't think that all grouse moor managers are persecuting hen harriers. There are those who are working positively to find ways for grouse shooting to coexist alongside harriers, and we need to encourage and support those, those businesses which, bring me, which brings me to the Heads Up Harriers project. The project is working well with a growing number of estates, up from five in 2015 to 21 this year. It's led by a partnership of the RSPB, um, Scottish Land Estates, the National Wildlife Crime Unit and SNH. And the partnership and cooperation are, are good, I think, for hen harriers. Um, to, to, kind of, to some extent, answer Andy Whiteman's point, I don't think anyone's suggesting that this project alone is, is, is the answer. But I, I think it's about bringing together all those groups in partnership to change the culture. The project um, has to build on the progress that it's making in some parts of the country in order to encourage more estates to work with it. The Heads Up Harriers partnership deserves a lot of credit, I think, for its collaborative approach and for the excellent um, on-the-ground relationships it has established. Um, I should stress that the Heads Up Harrier project has never intended to catch criminals. It was set up to raise public awareness of the hen harriers, to gain information of nest failures, and most importantly, to build trust and partnership with land managers to encourage the outlook of hen harriers on the states managed for shooting. And it is succeeding in meeting those objectives. Of course, we want to push the project in areas where harriers are not thriving, and we are doing this already. For example, the Heads Up Harriers is now working with states in the Angus Glens, where we know there is a history of lack of tolerance. Um, so I think rather than saying this is not the answer, we should be encouraging that work to, to continue. Um, I want to speed on to the other section of Marie Goujon's debate, and I, I hope I have time um, to, to say a, a few words about the wider Species Championship initiative um, before, the, before the PO um, ticks me off. Um, it is an innovative and it's a fun way of raising awareness for species that need conservation at attendance. Um, we've, we've heard a, a number of our colleagues raising their own particular species. Um, Christine Graham, I think, told us how she was single-handedly saving the house sparrow and, and making sure it sustained and was well, well, well washed. Um, but she then gave us a lecture on the evolution and the links between um, dinosaurs and birds, which I, I as a scientist, 
uh, find very interesting. Graham Day's tales of the Woolly Willows and his expeditions um, were very interesting also. Um, and obviously, Gillian Martin gave us a vivid picture of her youth. And, and I, I, I love her quote about how the U um, is the time lord of trees. And it's the, 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 the Very brief. Can, can I ask if it's not too cheeky, is the minister himself a species champion? And if not, would he be prepared to become one? That was Graham Day and now Joe Fitzpatrick. That, that, that was well below the belt, Mr Day. I am, I'm not, and I suppose I will. <laughs> <I've> <laughs> Mission accomplished, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so Mr Day did tell me there was a difficult question coming up, and I should have, I should have preempted myself for it by, by signing up before coming to the, 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 the debate. Um, anyway, I think ju just to conclude, the, the Scottish Government is, is very supportive of this in initiative, and it's gratifying to learn that the idea has not just been copied across this Parliament, but it's been um, copied down south and in other countries. To conclude, can I take the opportunity to congratulate Environment Link and Dr Elnor Harris for coming up with and developing the idea, and of course, Mary Goujon for bringing it to the Chamber. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. That concludes the debate and the meeting is closed.